Welcome to House Talk, with videos that'll provide maintenance tips unique to Trilogy at Vistancia Homes, with your host, Doug Bowman. Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about irrigation maintenance, steps that you can perform to keep your system operating at top performance. This video will cover filter cleaning, control valve maintenance, wiring of solenoids to prevent corrosion, and also some inspections for your emitters and bubblers to, and minor repairs if needed. I've added the times for each part if you want to jump to the section that is of most interest to you. You've seen this cover before. What is it? It's your control valve enclosure. This box is usually located not too far from where the water comes into your house. Inside you'll find control valves, filters, and you may also have a pressure regulator, but not all houses have them. Before working on your irrigation system, be sure to turn the controller to off, followed by isolating the water supply. You can do this at your irrigation backflow preventer. It's got two valves, one on the inlet and one on the outlet, and you can just close the one on the outlet valve. Our first maintenance activity today will be cleaning the irrigation water filters. You may have multiple of these depending on how many circuits you have on your system. Just a word of warning. Anytime you open up any device on your irrigation system, you may get water backflowing, especially if your enclosure is the low point of your system. For this particular style filter, you first open up the drain cap, which will relieve any pressure and make it easier to take the main cover off. To remove the main cover, just grab hold of the outer housing and unscrew it lefty-loosey. Be prepared for water. Once the filter is exposed, just grab hold of it and wiggle it out. Take note of the direction. Most filters can be installed either way, but your filter may be unique and may only be able to go in one way. These filters are extremely durable and really only need to be cleaned and reinstalled. So unless it's broken or torn, you shouldn't have to replace it. Just use a small brush or even a toothbrush to clean both the inside and the outside under running water. Once the filter is cleaned, just reverse the steps you used to remove it to reinstall. If that's all the work you're doing today, be sure to turn the water back on. Now we're going to perform maintenance on a control valve. Replacing control valve parts is a fairly simple task with little risk of consequence. Control valves have an expected life expectancy of 10 to 15 years. If your Trilogy home has never had these valves replaced, it's a good proactive maintenance practice to do so. Since most of these valves were installed before the filters, they're subject to dirt and mineral buildup that clogs the internal orifices causing them to leak by or not operate at all. The consequences of not maintaining them is greater than the consequences of trying to do it yourself. Instead of doing it down in the enclosure, with my hands and trying to take pictures down in there. We're going to do this on a workbench. It'll be much easier. So here I have a Hunter professional grade inline irrigation control valve. There are hundreds of these in Trilogy. If you don't have one that's a Hunter, you've probably got something that's very similar in size and design. Almost all of them have a solenoid valve on top. You've got a flow control valve that's normally backed all the way out so you're not limiting flow through the valve. And then you've got a manual open and closed valve. Uh, it's more of a needle valve here that you can use to introduce flow through the valve. Or you can also unscrew your solenoid partially and that'll allow flow to pass as well. It's pretty common, very easy to replace. But here's what I would tell you. If you ever have a problem with this solenoid valve or this control valve, Here's what you should do. You can look online. There's all sorts of manufacturer videos on how to repair them and how to troubleshoot them. But if you go to the store and you buy the diaphragm, the replacement diaphragm for this particular valve, it's going to cost you five bucks. If you go to the store and buy a new solenoid valve, it's going to cost you nine bucks. So there's 14 bucks right there. This entire valve assembly as you see it here with the solenoid, the diaphragm, and the entire casing is 18 bucks, four more dollars. It is easier, it's absolute worth every, every penny to do this replacement and do this repair by buying the entire set and just gutting the top off of it, 
leaving the casing connected to your piping and just replace the parts with four screws and two wire nuts for the solenoid. That's about the easiest project you can do to do maintenance if you haven't had this changed in the last 10 years or if you're having a problem with it, uh, this is probably the best fix and start instead of just replacing little parts until you get the problem solved. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to disassemble this as if it was a failed valve and then we'll reassemble it so you can see what it takes to do this. All right, so let's start with the solenoid valve. So first of all, the solenoid valve just screws into place. You'd have to determinate the wires from the wire nuts if that's uh, if you if it you were starting with a complete one. But you can see the solenoid valve here, and really the magnetic field just sucks in this little plunger here, a sixteenth of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch, the most. So you can see what the solenoid is doing when it's being energized, and you can kind of see what you're simulating when you thread this back out open it up a quarter turn to open and close the valve as well. You're kind of simulating the coil being energized and that piece being sucked in. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is that we're gonna replace the, the bonnet and take these four screws off. So I'm gonna do this a little quicker here using a drill. This is a 5 16th inch drill, but yours may be different. Now there's a diaphragm that's under here that's made of rubber and provides you with a water seal. So that's why this cover won't come off very easily. You're going to have to get underneath it and pry it up a little bit because you're going to break that seal. There it is there. On the bottom side here, you've got a spring. You got to make sure that you don't lose that. But if you're replacing it with an entirely new kit then uh, or a new valve, the top of a new valve, then that'll stay right on there. There's no other parts that are in here. But there are very small orifices that are in here that potentially could be plugged with dirt. So that's why I think it's a better idea to just completely change this housing with a new one altogether. That way, if your problem is actually that you have dirt inside your system, uh, you're not putting the old bonnet back on by just replacing a gasket. Here's the gasket that we talked about here. There's a little rubber piece here that you can grab onto and lift that up. Out comes the diaphragm and then also this collar. And that's it. There's no other removable pieces in here. This whole casing is one cast. Uh, so this, you know, unless this is somehow cracked because maybe it got frozen or something, you really don't need to replace this casing at all. You could just, you just use the top of a new valve assembly, change out the parts, put it all back together, and you're good as good as gold without having to buy individual pieces. So let's go ahead and reassemble it. All right. So here's our collar that we're going to slip on. There's no right or wrong way to do this. You just set that in there until it seats. We've got our gasket here and you can see there's one of those small orifices there that goes down this path here. So you want to make sure that there's no debris in here, but this lines up with that hole there. So put that on, fit this in press it in place. We're good to go there. And then make sure you've still got your spring here. Set this, excuse me, set this back on. You can't, you can't put this on the wrong way because there's actually little pins here that have to line up for you to be able to get this right. And if you put this on cockeyed, it wouldn't seat very well. So you've got to put it on the right way. That we're compressing the gasket there. Okay. Put the four screws in. And just get them started. And what you're going to do when you put this back together is you're going to do this in kind of a cross hatch so that you get a, uh, a good seal on this gasket. So I'm going to reverse my drill. I'll start over here. Tighten that down. Then I'm going to do the opposite corner. Then I'll do over here. And then over here. All right. 
Now, if I go from the sides and look from the sides, I can see that it's plastic on plastic. It's seated really good. Now the last thing to do is take my new solenoid valve, screw that in place. There we go. And then go reconnect the two uh, wires that I disconnected and then you're good to go. So there you go, 18 bucks for a whole new casing. And even though it costs you an extra five bucks, you've got assurances that this casing and the spring inside and the orifices are all clean and it'll solve your problems. Because your control valve enclosure is a wet location, electrical connections are especially prone to corrosion. When troubleshooting, you may think you've got a bad solenoid, when in reality you've just got a bad electrical connection. So whenever performing any wiring, be sure to use these waterproof wire nuts. You can find them at the hardware store, but you'll probably most likely find them in the irrigation aisle instead of the electrical aisle. They're pretty expensive, about 70 cents a piece, but they're worth it in the long run. And when you're done wiring, be sure to point them up so water doesn't puddle inside them. Solenoid wiring is a fairly simple task. If you have only one zone, you can just wire up the two solenoid wires to the two controller box wires. Since the solenoids are 24 volts AC, there's no polarity to worry about. You can reverse the wires without any effect on operation. Cut off any old twisted wire nut connections and strip the insulation back about a half inch to expose a nice clean straight copper conductor. Then use the outdoor silicone wire nuts as we previously talked about. For two zone systems, the control box sends out a voltage to each solenoid on demand via a hot wire, which is usually a red or green wire. To complete the circuit, the voltage returns to the control box via a neutral wire, which is usually a white wire. Both solenoids can share the neutral wire back to the controller. But if you're worried about messing up the wiring, the easiest thing you can do is to just disconnect and reconnect one solenoid at a time. Before we discuss the maintenance of drippers and emitters, let's review a few of the many different types. They come in all shapes, sizes, and flow ratings. These are just a few of them that are commonly used in the Trilogy area. Inline emitters are great for smaller plants and flower beds. They are linked together in series and have flows of 1 half, 1, and 2 gallons per hour. Don't read too much into the colors because each manufacturer uses their own color coding. These flag drippers are great for larger plants and shrubs that need flow rates of 1, 2, and 4 gallons per hour. Many people believe these flag drippers are adjustable because of the tab, but in reality the function of the tab is just so that they can be removed so you can flush out dirt. Bubblers are for larger areas than the largest of plants and trees. The bubbler here is adjustable from 0 to 16 gallons per hour. Turning the top clockwise will reduce the flow all the way to zero. Turning counterclockwise will increase the flow and the range to the maximum flow rate. For our last topic, we're going to talk about inspection and repair of bubblers and emitters. These are pretty reliable and typically won't fail. Even though they may look like they're corroded with calcium buildup, that really doesn't do a lot to block the flow, maybe 5 or 10%. So you don't necessarily need to replace them just because they look calcified. Just for demonstration purposes, I've elected to replace this bubbler. You can use water if you're using a dry connection. It'll make things slide on and off easily. Here you cut it just below the old emitter. Round it off. Spray it. It's more of a lubricant. Grab hold of the wire in your emitter and just push and turn until it seats. There, this one's got a little bit more to go. A little more pressure, and there it's seated. Open up the emitter. You'll come back later and check it once water's flowing to make sure you've got the right flow. But that's basically it for almost all type of emitters and bubblers. Your bubblers, drippers, and emitters really need inspection more than they need maintenance. Over time, shrubs and plants grow and have different needs. Lines get kicked around by landscaping crews. Or plants just die, but you continue to irrigate them. It's those types of things that you need to keep an eye out on. Here's some of my favorites. This rock has been being watered for years, but it still hasn't grown. This plant has been dead since last year's frost, but still continues to be watered. And I think this is my favorite. 
This irrigation line was used for this plant when it was much smaller, but it has since grown around it and actually engulfed the hose to where it can't be used anymore. It's clear this line hadn't been looked at in years before it got rerouted. In Arizona, the stronger a plant's root ball, the stronger the plant. Plants that were just two to three feet tall when planted can grow to be 10 or 20 feet or even taller. Over time, their irrigation needs change. As a root ball grows, you've got to move back your irrigation bubblers to accommodate. The farther the roots have to travel, the stronger the root ball will become. If you need supplies or materials to do your maintenance, just take a picture of them with your smartphone, take it to the hardware store. They're more than willing to help and they've got pretty good ample supplies. Now here's some of the key things we talked about in this video. Irrigation maintenance can be done by anyone with simple tools and simple materials. Replacing a control valve assembly is better done in full instead of just parts. Filters should be cleaned annually. And inspect your emitters as plants grow because you may have to move them back. If you like this video, you may like these other videos I've done specifically about Trilogy Homes. Thanks again, and if you like this video, hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe.